So last night, uh, Vancouver's Council passed the controversial first piece of the Making Room program. So that opened up most of the city's so-called single-family neighborhoods to duplexes. I'd like to hear as concisely as possible, what do you like or dislike about last night's decision? What do you think about the broader Making Room program and the changes that would bring other kinds of housing types, medium density housing types, to Vancouver neighborhoods that will come before the next council next year? And if you were elected mayor next month, what would you do, if anything, about this program, either last night's decision or the broader program coming before us in the next year? Shauna? Thanks, Dan. There is nothing new in terms of the idea of taking single family lots and increasing the density. That has been a conversation that's been going on in this city for years. It was a recommendation out of the 2012 Mayor's Task Force on Affordable Housing, and it's so hard to understand why so long, why it took so long in the last day of the mandate to bring that forward and to do it in a way that did not enable the kind of consultation that needed to be had. But it's not a new concept and it's certainly uh, increasing density gently across the city is absolutely essential to the future of this city. So I'm in favor of the notion of gentle densification in a way that respects the character of neighborhoods, doesn't go across the canopy and increases the supply. It has advantages for many, many neighborhoods, including most of all to the west side, uh, because it's going to help in, in, in the whole issue of the hollowing out of the west side, the extent to which kids aren't on the streets anymore, there are not enough customers to keep those uh, high streets vital, like Dunbar, like West 10. But there's a critical problem with the making room strategy. It does not provide an affordability mechanism. And so it's more of the same. Let's increase supply and hope that that will trickle down to create the affordability we need in the city. It does not. We've shown that time and time again. So I have proposed in my platform, which I published over a month ago, how to create an affordability mechanism. It's got two paths. One, if you're a homeowner and you're going to increase gentle densification on your land and you choose to create purpose-built affordable rental, then we're going to fast track you and we're not going to charge you the permit fees. But if you choose to create market-based rental, which is fine, you'll pay a community amenity contribution and that fee, which represents the value add to your property from the upzoning, will actually go back into affordable housing. That's the issue we have in this city. It's the fact that people can't afford to live here. So while we need to increase density, we cannot forget the fact that the issue is affordability and we need policies that put that in place. Thank you, Sean. Uh, next we'll have Fred. Thank you, Dan. Um, look, Shauna and I, uh, we agree on this. Uh, there's, I, I don't think there's a, there's a lot between us. Here's my issue. It was rushed. It was illogical. There'll be a new uh, administration coming in in just a matter of weeks. There is no reason to have rushed this through. If you believe that this is a great plan, or a good plan even, why wouldn't you leave it to the next administration to debate and to look at it and to review? It smacks to me of some smell of corruption. There is something wrong with this plan. It had to be pushed and rushed through. It tells me that there's something wrong with it, and we really need to give it close scrutiny. We've already made a decision that we will challenge this either in the court, if we're not able to revoke it. We understand that every community needs to have um, a measure of uh, density. But you have to do it on a community by community, uh, community by community plan. You have to look at each one separately. A blanket, a blanket decision like this goes against every amount of common sense that we need in running a city. It doesn't take into account the traffic impact when you create more density like this and the houses have more cars parking out there. We want to see houses having an ability to maybe raise another floor, but we need to do it by community by community um, decision where the communities have input. There was no consultation, no consultation on this decision. It was rushed through and it's wrong. Thank you. Okay. And David. Thank you, Dan. Um, 
So on the 18th, we were actually there and we created what is commonly known as a filibuster because we felt that, unfortunately, the democratic process was not followed. And it was ironic that that very day, an article was printed in one of the uh, newspapers and it was done by um, Patrick Conan. And he was one of our, our former colleagues in this race. And he said that if you don't have a community plan, you're putting the cart before the horse. And it makes a lot of sense. I agree with him. Because the problem is, in anything you do, whether you build this building, you have to have a blueprint. Without that blueprint, you have no idea what you're going to build and what impact that's going to have. As a kid that's been born and raised here, you can figure this out if you've lived here a long time and you've gone through all the streets. But the challenge is, when we look at maps from a bird's eye view, we actually have no idea what the streets are like underneath. Right? All you see is these zones that some people, the populace, thought is we're not allowed to build there. That's not the reality. There are some serious infrastructure issues with Vancouver, as Fred has pointed out. Um, I've talked to former city planners, and they say, when you have queued streets, you can't have more density because we depend on the gap in the parked cars to allow vehicle traffic to go through. The minute we increase density and that all zips closed, suddenly we're going to have problems with even first responders coming through. That's a huge concern to me if I was the mayor. Uh, you know, the last thing I would want to have happen is something that the council has okayed and somebody gets hurt because we didn't plan properly for what happens in an emergency. So we have to look more towards those types of issues in creating a community plan. So if I were elected mayor, the first thing I would do would be to repeal this or I have to go to court or whatever, depends. But that would only stand until we actually get to the point we have a community plan. We know that we have to have some density. But if we don't do this smartly, and I was talking to a business group, and they said, Bogota did this. They built the housing. They in, in, included all these masses, but they never thought about the infrastructure. And traffic and everything is a nightmare because there was a lack of a plan. Now, in this city, we're also very green. We have to think about what's the impact. If the profit makes it so that duplexes suddenly become more attractive, are we going to be destroying homes? A lot of times it's better green-wise to retain the home and to look at putting secondary suites in. I've had seniors come to me and said, you know, if you had a, a program that could help us build those, we would do it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're going to open it up to anyone to speak on this topic now. I, I would just like to, though, go for a moment to go back to Mr. Harding. You said that the decision last night on making room smacks to me of corruption and you're a former police officer so that's those are pretty strong words Wh yeah. where's your evidence of of corruption and what does it look like well look at city I, hall I, I have no evidence of, of corruption what i'm saying is smacks of corruption and i'll tell you why here you have a here you have a plan to rezone the entire city in the dying days of an administration what's the rush all we're hearing about is land deals that have been going on in our city is there a land deal here? Is this something that, we, that we're missing? Is this something that's being hidden? If you're so keen to rush this plan through, if this is a great plan, let the next administration look at it. Let's, let's review it. There's a reason this is being rushed through, and we want to know why. I'm, I'm going to challenge something here, because I've been a part of the housing conversation for so many years in this city. There is absolutely nothing new about this. In fact, they have gone far less of an ambitious plan here than I have heard talked about for the last six years. I think it's, I think we've, I would really hope that we could stay away from language like corruption because that suggests something that I don't think is really at play here. If there's anything I want to accuse Vision of is why have you not been talking about this for the last five years? Because this was one of the recommendations of 2012 and why did you wait to your last month and why haven't you renewed co-op leases and done so many other things on on housing I think those are the questions we need to be asking because those are the reasons we don't have affordability in the city only 25 percent of our city has community plans right now and guess who and guess which parts of our city are taking on all the growth why is it that east side of Vancouver and downtown over and over and over again are having to deal with the high forms of density. And meanwhile, and, and, and I have to challenge David Chen on this, 
Meanwhile, you have a hollowing out of an entire part of our city. The number one thing we could do for climate change in this city would be to increase the, num the number of people living in houses here. Right now, there are more people living on the west side in one, one person house than there are families of two, three, and four. That is a serious problem. It's also a serious problem in terms of the kind of community you want. People are isolated. Seniors are isolated. If you're sitting as I was in, in parts of Vancouver looking at housing for your parents, there was nowhere for them to downsize to. I lived for 30 years on Commercial Drive. Commercial Drive has actually had far more density than the rest of the city on the west side, and I couldn't find a place to downsize to because the density just wasn't there. We can't have affordability and continue to say we're going to wait forever for the community plans. Yes, community plans are important. Yes, they're important. And we need to empower our city staff, put them in the community so that they can get those plans done. But what I won't accept in this city is the tyranny of neighborhood associations that continue to say, not in my backyard. I actually believe, and my experience tells me from the last six months of heavy duty consultation on the west side, is that sentiment isn't there anymore. It's an old characteristic, an old characterization of the west side. That sentiment isn't there. They want families back on their street. They want housing their kids can move into, and they certainly want more homes that fit the character of their neighborhoods. So Mr. Chan, if you're gonna go through yes. this process of creating community plans, yes. that, meanwhile, the people are coming, so how are you going to deal with that? So we can actually accelerate it. We've talked to a lot of people, and they've actually said it's quite doable within nine months. I know that sounds like forever, but imagine, and Josh Gordon said this before too, he says, if you do an irreversible change to try and affect density and affordability, think about this, right? It could take years to unravel what could have been saved if you just did nine months of looking at what's going on. Now, to uh, address what Mr. Harding was saying about uh, anomalies, I don't say this is corruption, but he's correct, there is an anomaly. Because if you went to the public hearing, you would find out that Agenda 5, which was the mass rezoning, was pushed through. We had over 50 speakers speaking, speaking against it. From memory, we had like over 100 people that sent in submissions against it, and there was also petitions. Agenda 6 had similar numbers. Agenda 6 was pushed over to the next council, but Agenda 5 was not. It sort of begs the question why, you know? Both of those are asking huge questions about whether or not this is right, whether or not the community wants it, and yet one was passed, one was not. When we're talking about hollowing out, I have to challenge that because being a kid that was born and raised on the, the poor side of Point Grey, and I know people laugh at that, but if you've been here for over 40 years, the east boundary of Point Grey was very working class. My friends were army kids. They were not rich. We were not rich. But going back there and campaigning, because that's sort of my home territory, I've found out, I'm knocking on doors, there's a lot of empty homes. There's a lot of land banking going on. There's a lot of secrecy, but the neighbors know. When you're looking at land banking, when someone's paying cash for a property and they're not living in it, it's not you, it's not me. The reality is we have a problem with unregulated global capital. And I'm not trying to say it's from one country, it's from all over the place. It's interprovincial, it's national, it's international. We need to get that out of the system first before we worry about densification because even if you densify, none of those properties are gonna densify. That's not why they're being held that way. When we're talking about Dunbar, I know lots of people that live there and they see the same problem. They complain about the same problem. This is not an issue of affordability for locals. This is an issue that someone has purchased a property, they're sitting on it to appreciate the value and that has to exit out of our system. So we need to use powers of the city that are in the chart that says if it's wrongfully used, the city can actually take over the stewardship. It can bring it back up to code. It can bring it back into service. Well, imagine if the city actually did this, put a renter in there and then charge the owner for that. Well, this land banking thing would start to decrease the word we get out on the street. And that's something that we're looking at, at in terms of trying to address this problem. You think that's feasible? You look at the problem landlords, the downtown east side of the SROs, this is an issue that's plagued the city for decades. It's not new. Yes. The city has only very recently taken the step of expropriating some of the very worst hotels. So in those most egregious of circumstances, the city's only been able to do that after a long time. Yes. Do you think 
the city taking over, mm -hmm. uh, expropriating a private home that's maybe underutilized a few months of the year or something or not used at all, is that feasible? Well, expropriation and taking over stewardship are two different things. How so? Uh, well, expropriation actually requires court orders to step in. You have to pay fair market value on the property. This is actually, in my opinion, what went wrong with the taking over the SROs downtown. We're expropriating properties that are in disrepair. They're not fair market value, and we are paying fair market value for it. However, within the city charter, there is also a clause that says the city can enforce bringing those living accommodations up to code during the tenure that the landlords have. Why was that not done? These SROs are taking social benefit money and they're providing substandard living accommodations and the city never stepped in to regulate that. But, but is, it, is it feasible to imagine the city could take over stewardship of someone's empty house in Dunbar or Point Grey? They're not here, why not? Well, I imagine they would <clears throat> fight against that. Absolutely, it's their that's pro they own it. And that's what we want. We want to capture the attention. Right now, the problem we have in Canada, not just Vancouver, but in Canada, they have said that we are the money laundering capital of the world because it is 20 times easier to money launder here than in the U.S. So we need to throw some roadblocks in place, plain and simple. Whether Can I ask this is a easy, question? please. Are you asserting that every home that doesn't have somebody living in it is the product of money laundering? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that it is a contributing factor. And when you see homes that are boarded up, those are ones that we want to go after. And bottom line, just like the reality that Point Grey isn't all of the problem, but it steers our affordability issue. We want to look at a situation where if we can start to impact something, it will steer the ship back. This is, this is uh, what, what my friend's saying here, what David's saying is, this is everything that's wrong. You know, I'm saying that there is an, there's an air of something that stinks about less nice decision. What also really concerns me is everybody seems so content to attack people's property rights. You must, ha you must allow people to have property rights if their property is empty. We have snowbirds here. We have uh, overseas uh, residents here who have businesses and, and their, their property is empty and, and the immediate um, like jump, jump to clauses that we seize or sequester their properties. This is wrong. This is what's wrong with the schools tax. We've already said that we're going to attack and, and sue the NDP because this is an attack on people's property rights. It's just wrong. The empty home tax is an attack on people's property rights. It's their property. So it concerns me when you're talking about you see an empty home that if you were the administration, you would want to take it over. That's a global statement. So I've said previously in the media and on record that we want a laser focus system. The snowbird is not my issue. The person who's been living here 30, 40 years, paying consumption taxes, building community, not my issue. The obvious one, boarded up homes. There's nobody there. That's where you start impacting the system. And when you start cleaning that up, people are going to start to react. When they know that it's not going to be that easy, a lot of this starts to shift and change.